first things first, I would like to congratulate the inductees and the honor societies tonight. Everyone join me, please. I wish to express my thanks to the university, to Dr. Inman, to Pi Gamma Mu, and to Dr. Cherry, who couldn't be here tonight because she has recently given birth to the newest, probably most likely the newest member of the Central Methodist University family. So let's congratulate Dr. Cherry. <laughs> Dr. Cherry was my faculty liaison through all of this. I am honored and privileged to stand before you tonight in the shadow of Dr. Merrill Gaddis and to speak about a, a topic, a concept that I am incredibly devoted to and I thoroughly believe, believe in. It is an incredibly complex yet gratifying topic, leadership and ethics, and the concept that leadership is in fact a career choice. When I retired from the police department in 2002, I was commander of the investigations division. You've heard some of this, but I'm going to repeat it. The division included detectives, detective sergeants, civilian investigators, think about that, the Property and Evidence Unit, the Anti-Crime Unit, and Internal Affairs, which was formerly known as the Professional Standards and Investigations Bureau. Because of all of this, I sometimes think that I know a little bit about conducting investigations. So that led me to look into and seek some information about Dr. Merrill Gaddis. Merrill Gaddis was an avid Civil War historian, and I'm very pleased to say that I share that interest. Um, however, I was I was not nearly involved in, uh, or am not involved in it as he was. He would frequently spend his summer recess traveling to Civil War historical sites across the country studying and learning from them. Dr. Gaddis was well known across the campus as thorough, firm, fair, and supportive. And his students, they agreed that they received the grade or the results that they deserved. No one ever challenged him over test, paper, or final grades. And that speaks a lot in terms of the respect that they shared for him. Many students during his years here at Central were, were World War II or Korean War vets. And that brings me to other findings. In the classroom, his reputation soared. He was an impeccable dresser, not flashy, but always in a, in, in a suit, tie, and starch shirt. He would enter his classroom precisely on time each day. He would set his briefcase down alongside this very lectern, <coughs> remove his wristwatch, place it up here in the corner. Without the benefit of notes, references, email, Google, Twitter, Facebook, or PowerPoint, he would lecture to his students for 40 minutes nonstop. And because of that lecture style, he earned a nickname, probably from those very same military veterans, as machine gun gas. <laughs> Machine Gun Gaddis. I would have thoroughly enjoyed his knowledge, insight, wisdom, and presence. I'd like to begin tonight with two questions for you folks. Would anyone like to give me a one or a two word definition of leadership? First thing comes to your mind. Sir, um, Travis. The ability, the ability to bring up the best of others. Okay, that's good. I need a one or a two. I would, I would say, now what you're talking about is influence. That is the most common reply that I get. The second most common reply I get to this, to this question is power or authority. And they are very seductive factors indeed. Second question, how many of you are parents? I'll raise my hand also. I'll get back to that thought later, but for now, let's just give it some time to simmer. Don't let everyone, anyone ever tell you that leadership is an abstract. There are many scholarly thoughts and opinions about it. It is somewhat mysterious, no question, but at the same time, it is meaningful, purposeful, and constructive. I sometimes think of it as organic. Organic because it breathes life into lives. And I first became a student of, of leadership in 1991, and I've made countless presentations about supervision and leadership over the years. Ordinarily, they are in the form of, of three or five day seminars. But there's a reason why there is such vivid interest in this topic. I believe that leadership is in fact a career choice, and that it is because of the impact of what is known as 
true leadership that ordinary people can achieve extraordinary things. It is because of the impact that I believe in it, I trust in it, and I'm so passionate about it. And yes, I am very passionate about it. There's no question that I am hardwired for optimism rather than for doubt, and that there's an engine that runs at very high speed inside of me. That biographical sketch that Heidi read to you, and I sometimes wonder, who is that guy they're talking about when I hear that? You just, that indicates that I spent a large portion of my adult life as a public servant, as a law enforcement officer. I was a patrol officer and then a detective. I was a first line and then a second line supervisor. I was a mid-level manager and then a bureau and a division commander. Uh, and you know, when I, when I talk about that, I have to mention my, the end of my career when I had all these duties and obligations and authority and responsibilities. Without my administrative assistant, I would have failed. I spent a great deal of time functioning in a multi-tiered and highly structured organization. When I say highly structured, I mean a complex vertical and horizontal organizational chart. When I retired in 2002, the police department was comprised of 288 men and women, including sworn officers and our civilian staff. Our primary purpose was to protect the largest single mass transit system in the country. The system served several hundred thousand people twice a day, going to work in the mornings, coming back home at night. It's a very complex state agency. It's owned and operated by the state of New Jersey. And as a 24-7 operation, it employs nearly 10,000 people. Considering that the state of New Jersey owns and operates it, you can imagine what a very sensitive political entity it is. Earlier in my life, actually prior to my enrollment here at Central, I was an enlisted man in the U.S. Army. So yes, I have spent considerable portions of my adult life embedded in multi-tiered operations, organizations, agencies. Along the way, as life's experiences unfolded, just as so many of you have, I noticed things about leadership. I also suffered the absence of leadership. In the years prior to my enrollment here, earlier in my life, between the ages of 6 and 11, my family lived in downtown Boston. So if you hear a funny accent coming from up here, that may explain it. We lived adjacent to a hospital where my dad was the assistant director, and our home was comfortable but aging housing that the hospital provided for our family. It was in what we call a very blue-collar neighborhood, the block-long row of four-story brick buildings across the street. That was only one side of a four-sided square block. It was all apartment housing. There was an interesting uh, ethnic and cultural mix there, Irish and Portuguese. They were hardworking, proud, independent, and faith-driven neighbors. The rooftops of those buildings across the street were a frequent and pleasing playground. The rooftops. Each building had an 18-inch wide gap between one and the next. As young boys, we would race across those rooftops, jump from one building to the, to, to the next, and then look out over our small world, and we absolutely loved it. I certainly did. And of course, we also hoped that our mothers wouldn't know what we were doing and where we were. I have incredibly fond memories of those times and places, and they helped to underscore the building blocks in my DNA, but life wasn't all about rooftops. I can clearly, clearly remember that summer, hot summer in Boston when I was nine and having to recite Longfellow before I could go out and play in the mornings. My parents insisted that we commit to family, faith, and education, that we involve ourselves in the community, that we learn to navigate a card catalog in the library, that we work hard, that we vote, that we learn to swing a hammer, change a tire, and barbecue a steak, that we bear the flag of our country, study the classics, and go to college that we forgive and be forgiven, allow for second chances, turn a double play, and reject a double standard. They also insisted that we sing in the shower regardless who might be annoyed. <laughs> they also made it possible for, her, for us to sail the deep blue waters of Cape Cod, to, to ski the frozen New England slopes, to recognize constellations in the skies and picture faces in the clouds. I made certain that we knew that we must listen to the voices of past generations. And they also insisted that we know that 
on time is good, early is better, and late is unacceptable. Parenting fits leadership very well, and that's why I focus on it tonight, and I'll spend some time telling you what leadership is not. But my message will include certain comments and observations about true leadership, the link between leadership and ethics, our moral compass, leadership myths and truisms, role modeling, motivation, and the common things that true leaders do. Along the way, you may begin to believe, as I do, that leadership is, in fact, a career choice, and that because of the impact of true leadership, that ordinary people can accomplish extraordinary things. As I mentioned in my opening, leadership is one of life's mysteries. Oh, there's no question. After all these years of studying it and teaching it, it continues to perplex me more often than I probably should admit. Yes, it is mysterious. One of my texts even called it enigmatic, but it is not an abstract. Although it may be difficult to quantify, it is easily recognized. True leadership is, without question, what some refer to as the it factor, meaning that you know when it's there and you know when it's missing. You know when it's there, you know when it's missing. It was during the mid to late 1950s and amongst human behavioral sciences that the concept of true leadership began to emerge. It developed as a new hypothesis and then it gathered momentum and true leadership was what we recognize today as the key ingredient in how those ordinary people can achieve extraordinary things and the enormous and gratifying impact it can have on lives, on careers, on groups, and on organizations, and on those that really care because true leaders really care. This is the it factor at work. You know when it's there and you know when it's missing. It is certainly more than being in charge or out in front of the pack. Many people are in charge at all levels of all organizations. We find them in finance, in healthcare, in science and technology, in academia, in government, in entertainment, in manufacturing, and in faith-based organizations. Yes, many people are in charge, but unfortunately, not all are the true leaders that we need, need and we crave. You know, society tends to apply the leader label to all of those that are out there in charge or have somehow, somehow been installed in positions of authority or in high places. Why that I, is, I don't know, but that mindset needs to go away. Listen, and we'll hear about leadership from the media constantly, and we hear it in the sporting world much too often. How is it that the concept has been so watered down, or some have, have come to misunderstand it? Make no mistake, true leaders are much more than those that are out in front or merely in charge. True leaders are the dynamic men and women that make a positive, wholesome, and meaningful difference in our lives, in our careers, in our groups, and in our organizations. True leaders make a difference. They leave footprints, and we should settle for nothing less. We should settle for nothing less. Leadership and the prevailing wisdom governing its descriptions, its definitions and applications, yes, they've often been distorted or simply misunderstood. If you think about it, leadership seems to be the trendy in thing these days. And in some camps, it's become synonymous with being cool, and that's a very shallow perception at best. Many of us have noticed during the recent past that lots of prominent people seem to be writing books about it. They call these celebrity leadership books, but let's not forget about their professional co-authors. Rudy Giuliani wrote one. Joe Torre wrote one, Bill Bratton wrote one, Donald Trump wrote one, Bill Clinton wrote one, Jack Welch wrote one. There's even a leadership book for dummies. <laughs> Which is not why I read it. But I must confess to you that I wrote one, I wrote one too. I wrote one too, but uh, I never attempted to publish it, although the title is, Leadership is a Career Choice. Over the years, I have pretty much read them all, but I'm not about to rush out and read any of them again, those celebrity leadership books. That may be because, yes, I value research texts, or it may be because you can purchase almost any one of those books right now today on Amazon for about the same price as a 20-year-old Stephen, <coughs> Stephen King or Jonathan Kel Kellerman novel. And there's quite a message in there. The message might have something to do with the it factor, you know when it's there and you know when it's missing. So let me expand this thought tonight because clearly there is a vital link 
between true leadership and ethics. They are hardly two distant or detached concepts. Not only do they sustain each other, but they are concurrent and codependent. You cannot have one, leadership and ethics, you cannot have one without the other, and reasonably expect to achieve personal and professional success, fulfillment, growth, gratification, throw in a, because, and it doesn't matter, it's regardless of, of where you are, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our communities, in the place of worship, you cannot have one with the other and reasonably expect that kind of success personally and professionally. Leadership, certainly, it's about that influence factor. The common denominator always seems to be influence, but I flavor it all generously with great character and role modeling. When constructing this lecture, I hit a wall here. This presentation is remar remarkably different from what I normally do, uh, both because of the setting and the diverse audience. If you look <coughs> around, folks, we've got a very, very diverse audience here. But I also struggled how to accurately but concisely address the issue of character and all its critical components. Remember, I said I'm used to having three to five days. <laughs> what emerged is this, great character, what it means. It means a strong and vibrant moral and ethical compass that points in the direction of what our society commonly recognizes and values and that you and I have an absolute right to expect. Let me repeat that. Great character means a strong and vibrant moral and ethical compass that points in the direction of what our society commonly recognizes and values and that you and I have an absolute right to expect. Now, those common character traits include honesty, integrity, trust and trustworthiness, accountability, responsibility, patience, prudence, discretion, fairness, courage, sacrifice, and a measure of steadfast excellence. You can add other qualities, and I do also, I have what I call a subset, including loving, caring, sharing, kind, objective, consistent, knowledgeable, optimistic, and loyal. But hold on for a minute. I want to talk to you about loyalty. Red flags go up when I consider the issue of loyalty. And that is in how, how it is or may be applied. I strongly believe that one must be loyal to personal principles and values rather than to people. Yes, it is fine to be so supportive or accommodating to people, but loyalty can be easily misplaced. That moral compass that I mentioned is the ethical foundation of our lives. It supports our families, the workplace, the communities we live and are involved in, and the houses of worship that we frequent. As a foundation of everyday life, it is present when we're sharing activities with our family. It is present when we're attending a functional meeting at work. That is, if there is such a thing as a functional meeting at work. It's present when we're out on the golf course or out for a run or shopping, for that matter. I know it's present when I'm cruising down a back road on that motorcycle of mine. Our moral compass defines the behaviors that we expect of ourselves and that we may in turn expect from peers, superiors, and subordinates alike. And it must reflect the values of that society that we live, work, and thrive in. If we were seeking a definition of leadership earlier, let's kind of turn our attention to defining or describing ethics. And remember I said that true leadership and ethics are codependent. I'm not going to wrestle with this definition. I would rather turn it over to the Oxford English Dictionary. Ethics is a set of moral principles. It is the fundamental rules of personal conduct. It is a set of values that guide our choices and our actions. Set of moral principles, rules of personal conduct values that guide our choices and our actions. Now that definition won't stand alone tonight. I would like for each of us to briefly look within and consider where our ethical foundation really, really came from. There has been a great ongoing debate for years amongst some enormously gifted sociologists and philosophers. They're discussing whether or not ethics and ethical behavior is faith-based. I am by no means prepared to participate in this debate, but I can share some of the findings of the others. There are three prominent ones. Some say yes, ethics is faith-based and our religious convictions establish very high personal standards and intense motivational motivation for ethical behavior. Others say its origin is simply what our laws, rules, and regulations tell us. 
But I say let's not overlook the fact that not all laws, rules, and regulations are moral or ethical. Third, still others say ethical origins are merely a matter of what human instinct tells us is right or wrong. However, I think it's important that we understand that instinct, instinct is innate. Inborn impulses, innate inborn impulses lack logical thought and applied reason. The debate over the ethical origins, whether they're faith-based, defined by rules of law, or instinctive. Well, we're not going to settle that tonight. Absolutely not. But we can look within. As I suggested a moment ago, we can look within. I personally tend to believe and trust in the faith-based path. At the same time, let's recall that I said that objectivity is one of the subset of character traits I mentioned a few moments ago. As I look around in the terms of strict objectivity, or perhaps my very pragmatic side. I certainly realize that there are many atheists and agnostics amongst us that manifest extraordinarily high ethical conduct and behavior. True leadership, regardless of the venue, is a very noble calling, but it must be tended to at all times. It must be enriched and maintained because it is so very fluid. It is an unfortunate reality that many of our finest qualities and trait are, traits are, in fact, perishable. Some, them, some among us are particularly vulnerable to that incredibly seductive factor that I mentioned earlier, power. In high places, power or authority is a vigorous presence, but it is so potentially seductive or addictive that it can be venomous. I find it ironic or perhaps tragic that power, influence, and authority could so easily undermine our chosen and perhaps a lifetime path of values and principles, and then lead to what we call ethical contamination or compromise. That effect is also known as ethical fallout. Leadership is very much a noble calling. It must be tended to, sheltered, and even defended, because when power becomes toxic, ethics are very much at risk, and in a sense, gravely perishable. Our true leaders will, they must, purposely sustain and uphold their great character traits. I have to avoid the, the traps, the pitfalls. When I speak of life's journeys, I include the pathways, pursuits, and the ultimate achievement of ambitions, ideals, and goals. So allow me to speak about ambition for another minute. Character and ambition, ethics, they can all flourish together fruitfully. But we must be vigilant in calculating the cost and the risk. And while I much prefer having ambitious persons on my team, there's ample room for those that are more static. My dad used to say to me, keep your eye on the ball. Don't ever lose sight of where you came from, where you are today, and where you're going in life. He left those thoughts for me to consider. But what he didn't say, and I had to discover on my own, is that if where you are going today is satisfactory, then that's as high as far, or as far as you are ever going to go, personally or professionally. If you are content and satisfied with your position, stage, or life, as they are right now today, well, perhaps that's quite all right, but that's really as far as you're ever going to go because ambition is no longer a part of the equation. That moral compass I spoke of a few moments ago, it's a truly dynamic force, and because of it, true leaders become role models for their peers, superiors, and subordinates alike. Role modeling for peers, superiors, and subordinates alike, this is not some revolutionary radical or groundbreaking concept. It's been around for ages. The fact is, each of us has the capacity to impact and mold the lives, the careers of those around us. Peers, superiors, and subordinates alike. Role models certainly don't always come from above. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, and I quote, if a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep the streets even as Michelangelo painted or Beethoven composed music, or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a good street sweeper, unquote. Every time I read or I hear that quote from Martin Luther King about the street sweeper, I get a very vivid snapshot in my head about this man's moral compass, and I'll tell you what, he can work for me anytime. Jay Gatsby, in F. Scott Fitzgerald's famous novel, said, Life is much more successfully looked at through a single window. 
Well, I don't agree that we can compartmentally, compartmentalize so easily. I choose to look through many windows and, and perhaps from those rooftops in my youth. And I see that thanks to true leadership, ordinary people can accomplish extraordinary things. Let me speak about role modeling for a moment, but there's no need to seek definitions because you feel it rather than define it. It's a force that's difficult to ignore. True leaders mold the lives of those they interact with, their peers, superiors, and subordinates alike. And we find them at every rung of the ladders of life, personally and professionally. We often find that true leaders are eager, enthusiastic, energetic, and a positive and cheerful influence in the workplace. Now please allow me to throw another caution in here that just because they might be eager, enthusiastic, energetic, and a positive and cheerful influence doesn't mean that they have to be the cheerleader for the organization or that they can't have or don't have a bad day every now and then. But they aren't sullen, unforgiving, disinterested, treacherous, easily provoked, caustically angered. And they most certainly don't always have to have an immediate answer to a question or a solution or to a problem. Guess what, folks? We don't have a red S painted on our chests. Ordinary people <coughs> is what we are. I said a few moments ago that leaders mold lives and as a result, ordinary people can accomplish extraordinary things. And I believe that with every ounce of my being. I can't convey my thoughts about role models unless I talk about me for a minute or two. And I have been incredibly fortunate to have had marvelous role models in my life. And I'm certainly not ashamed to stand in front of you tonight and say that I stole something. A little or a lot from each. The most prominent role model would have to have been my dad. He put himself through Harvard in three years with a wife and two kids after World War II, with only a GI Bill and a part-time job underwriting insurance policies at night. He was a genuine war hero, awarded the Air Medal six times and the Distinguished Flying Cross. After Harvard, he earned a fellowship from the American College of Healthcare Executives, and he became a career hospital CEO. In his retirement, he was the Assistant Commissioner of Human Services for the state of New Jersey, and finally a visiting professor of medical ethics at George Washington University. He was known for his vision and his charisma, so I often ask myself, who are his role models? My grandfather was a medical doctor, and my great-grandfather a master carpenter. Faith, ethics, effort, perseverance, commitment, and true leadership stand out. Now, I'll not reveal the name, but a professor was here at Central during my time as a student that I would like to think mirrored the skills, the knowledge, the demeanor, the overall effort, commitment, the attributes of Dr. Merrill Gaddis. On a bleak November morning, the professor was teaching one of those required courses that many freshmen were enrolled in. And there in the front of the classroom, he suddenly set his lesson plan aside. And he spoke to me and to my classmates in a heartfelt manner. His words literally assaulted my spirit. I have never forgotten his message. He challenged us to pursue excellence, to rise up in the face of life's trials, and to never give up. He continued to mentor me during my years here, and I would occasionally stop by his office just, say, just to say hello. Other times I'd have to stop in because I was seeking encouragement or guidance. The very last thing I did on my last day here before driving off the campus the very last thing I did was go to see him, remind him of that bleak November day, to thank him for putting his lesson plan aside and for his ethics, his courage, his great counsel, and a profound sense of leadership. Now I must tell you, this is gonna be a little audio-visual thing. I wandered through a less than remarkable academic record in my earlier years. That's a fact, and I'll just leave it at that. My brother's in the back of the room. He's got a grin on his face like this. <laughs> I finally remedied past performance when I began my postgraduate studies in 1977. How I, however, I can easily recall the day of my high school graduation when they opened the doors wide. They gave me one of these. And that may explain why I was in the US Army a few short months later. There have been others that have been and are terrific role models. My uncle Richard Driscoll, Central, class of 1951, and a former student of Dr. Gaddis, by the way. Uncle Dick, raise your hand. There in the back row, folks. 
Prominent others include my son Kevin and my daughter Kathy. And I hope that says something about me. So yes, I have certainly been blessed with the inspiration, the influence, the impact of those that traveled with me through life's journeys towards my ambitions, ideals, and goals. And I'm not done yet. They're all ordinary people that have accomplished extraordinary things, and I chose not to forget them. I would like to briefly address mythology and dismiss some of the most prominent myths and misconceptions over the concept of true leadership. And I may surprise you with one or two. Number one, leaders are those that are in charge. Well, I already shed some light on this. There's no question in my mind that those that are out in front or merely in charge or have somehow been installed in high places in agencies, organizations. There's no question that position, status, or title do not equate to true leadership. Myth two, leaders are born. Well, I've yet to hear a geneticist speak about a newborn endowed with the, the leadership gene. Undeniably, certain personality traits help. They help. But the essential qualities of true leadership are learned and developed rather than acquired at birth. Myth three, leaders need to be harsh, callous, or ruthless. There is a perception that being a, su a success in any organization requires you to be the toughest boss around or the alpha dog. Yes, tough love is sometimes the most appropriate remedy to a difficult circumstance. And the true leader, yes, will have to firmly stand his or her ground. However, being cruel, unpleasant in the long run creates more discouragement, more resentment, more failure than success. Myth four, leadership requires formal power or authority. Well, let's look at our street sweeper as the ideal example. Informal leaders can gather intense admiration and trust, and because of that, they influence others to perform at high levels. Remember our peer superiors and subordinates like Informal leaders, they are often very essential to the formal leader's success because they help to pull, pull the team, the group, the organization forward and in the same direction. Myth five, <laughs> leaders need to objectively be task-oriented in terms of employee motivation. I say, absolutely not. Now I'll disclose why I say not, no in a few minutes, but for the present let me simply say that I firmly believe that true leaders do not have to be focused upon motivation. Myth six, charisma is an essential uh, component of effective leadership. This is the last of our myths, but it's certainly no less important. Charisma is essential to effective leadership. Well, this may be the greatest trap of them all. Let's understand that charisma is a personality trait. Charismatic people can be charming, witty, persuasive, endearing, engaging, magnetic. They can be invigorating, but they do not automatically possess any special powers, knowledge, or skill, nor are they somehow heroic. Please understand my position. Uh, I'm not trying to talk down, put down charismatic people because I believe, I firmly believe that there is ample room in any organization for them and they are certainly welcome. All of us have experienced very charismatic people and in my lifetime I might cite John Kennedy, Ed Koch, Bill Clinton, and Oprah Winfrey. But then there are others that have been equally successful, dynamic people, but they had a less than engaging presence. Margaret Thatcher, Bill Gates, Michael Bloomberg, or even Richard Nixon, and some charismatic people throughout the course of history. Well, they've caused enormous suffering. Stalin, Hitler, Charles, Man Charles Manson, Bernard Madoff, or John Gotti, for example. And you'll recall that I mentioned earlier that red flags go up when I think of loyalties to people as opposed to personal principles and values. I experienced this firsthand as the most charismatic person I ever met worked with and for me. He was, just, he was just an enormous presence, a compelling presence. People flocked to him. In a crisis, he was a dynamic and effective force. But in the routine, everyday, mundane, ordinary tasks and duties, he was dreadful and simply could not be trusted to perform as, as expected. Unfortunately, because of his magnetic personality, 
he would shed his most unattractive traits on the young and impressionable employees. Think of careers at risk, and therein lies the trap. So once again, let's dispel these myths. Say no to each. Leaders are those that are in charge. No. Leaders are born. No. Leaders need to be ruthless. No. Leaders require position, status, or authority. No. Leaders need to purposely and objectively motivate. No. Charisma is essential. An essential component of leadership, absolutely not. Now, I would like to speak about the other side of the coin. Things that we can rely upon here. These are known as the truisms. These are the common building blocks of leadership, and we may depend on them. Truism one, the most prominent of our leadership truisms, is that the organizational culture is a reflection of the ethical values of those at the top, those leading the organization. Organizational culture flows top down. Truism two, leaders must insist upon accountability, and in terms of performance, behavior, and conduct, accountability must be stressed at every level of your organization. The idea is a successful outcome, and that's why we need the, that success breeds successful outcomes. Truism number three, leaders are teachers. If employees are, are to meet organizational standards and expectations, they must be dialed in. Leaders must be teachers. An essential component of the true leader's duties is to maintain and support employee development. And that means that they must ensure that employees know how and why and where it needs to get done. And if they don't personally show them, then they must provide the necessary helping hand so that those employees can meet the, the organizational's expectations. Truism four, leaders must manage trust. By this I mean that from the top down there must be standard of focus, reliability, and consistency and objectivity. People would much rather follow those that they can trust and know what, the, who, what they can count on, even when they disagree with that person's point of view, rather than to follow someone that they may agree with but who's constantly jumping on or off the bandwagon. Truism five. This is the last, and this is going to get a bit complex, but leaders must be able to adapt to the human dimension. What I'm speaking about is we're going into leadership styles here, but it's technically known as the adaptive and situational leader, and that speaks for itself. What I think the most apparent difference amongst the human species is the learning curve. The most apparent difference from all of us in this room, the human species. That is how well individuals absorb, learn, and then retain that which is presented to them. And those of us that have been down these roads, we know that you nearly encounter very, very complex personalities entering or embedded into the workplace. This is an enormous challenge because, number one, some are highly educated, very intuitive, and trustworthy. We know them as our go-to types. Recognize that phrase? Our go-to types. We should often leave them alone to produce and create at very high levels. Go-to people, they are visionary thinkers and willing problem solvers. They may very well resent a hovering presence, so we must monitor them, them from the, an arm's length. Others, number two, these are the individually and competitive goal-oriented types, and they're known as the it's all about me types. They're generally here for a paycheck and a line on their resume. And we often find that they are bright, clever, manipulative. They will need guidance, challenge, a fair measure of restraint, and a very healthy workload. Some others are what I describe as low readiness. They may likely have elementary or entry-level skills. They're quite content to get along in the back of the pack. They would, will consume support and guidance. They'll always need it. They are often waiting for the clouds to part so as to reveal their true path in life. Now remember what I said earlier about stealing? I stole that line from a friend and a member of the class of 1968. Low readiness. They're often waiting for the clouds to part so as to reveal their path in life. Low readiness will likely need to be led by the hand in order to meet organizational standards and expectations. 
So clearly, our adaptive and situational leader cannot treat everyone equally. He or she is now embarking on one of those times in life when they must selectively discriminate. Adapting in this circumstance is required they should or must discriminate against some and in favor of others. And that's okay because of the learning curve and the human dimension. Very adroit communication and employee assessment skills are necessary for this adaptive and situational leader. So once again, the five truisms, they are reliable, meaningful tools, tactics, and strategies. That the organizational culture is a reflection of the character traits, the behaviors of those at the top. That we must insist upon accountability, that leaders are teachers, that they must manage trust, and that they must adjust to the human dimension. Some of you that are involved in, in business, corporate affairs, or organizational hierarchy, you probably know or suspect that your competition already knows much of this. So a conspicuous issue now before us is that one of motivation that I said I was going to speak of later. In my earlier dialogue, I didn't elaborate upon the myth of a leader's duty and obligation to motivate those within his or her span of control. I purposely postponed that until now. So here it goes. I believe without the slightest doubt that leaders are not responsible to overtly or objectively motivate. If I may, I'd like to, to share with you a personal experience. And it may better explain why I harbor this particular conviction. In June of 1997, I was presenting when you know it, my very first supervision and leadership seminar, my very first one. They were all sergeants and lieutenants who were primarily working in the trenches. This was a three-week program, and late in the second week, I was just cruising right along thinking I was doing such a great job, when a lieutenant in the room suddenly spoke up. Now, he was a very salty and seasoned lieutenant who had pretty much seen it all, and he had been noticeably skeptical. He was noticeably skeptical throughout much of the program, and skeptical is a, is a good description of his attitude and his demeanor. And I knew, or I at least expected, that sooner or later, something was coming. In front of that crowded room, he took his best shot at this whole leadership theme when he abruptly asked, do you mean to tell me that it's my duty to motivate these people? I paused for a good 20 seconds. The room was very, very quiet, the clock was ticking. And I know some of them out there in the room were thinking, oh boy, he's got him now, how's he gonna squirm out of this one? Well, I let the dust settle and this became a very crystallizing moment for me. I say that because I was a very salty and seasoned veteran lieutenant as well. My advantage that day was that I had a very firm grasp on my chosen subject. I also believed in it and I practiced it. I looked out at the room and all those gathered, not just at him, and I said, no, you do not. You do not have to motivate your people. Motivation, or the lack of it, is a byproduct of all that you do, you do or you don't do for and with those people. Again, no, you do not. You do not have to motivate your people. Motivation, or the lack of it, is a byproduct of all that you do or don't do for and with your people. So now, I know that many of you are certainly asking yourself, well, just what are all those things that true leaders do for and with their people? The vital equation, the equation that promotes all of this success revolves intently around certain things that true leaders do. They do it to ensure not only team, group, and organizational good, good fortune and success, but the growth, the development, and the satisfaction of the individuals that they interact with. What do they do? They must direct them control them, support them, encourage them, mentor them, role model them, teach them, train them, praise, reward, criticize, and discipline them. Once again, true leaders direct, control, support, encourage, mentor, role model. Teach, train, praise, reward, criticize, and discipline. These are the, the, the keys to success, and they are an ongoing ethical duty and responsibility. So allow me to introduce a truism of my own. When I speak of all of these things, I suggest that true leaders don't need to do all of these things all of the time. But they certainly must do most of these things all of the time. 
I asked two questions in the very beginning. I hope the question about a definition or description of leadership has at least been colorized and maybe I've rounded out some rough edges. A few moments ago, I floated a subtle question whether or not ethics and ethical behavior is faith-based. I mentioned that I, I certainly tend to believe in the faith-based assertion governing the formation of our personal ethical standards and values and the formation of our, of our own moral compass. I do this because I was steadfastly taught and role modeled by my parents at a very early age, and it has never really stopped. And the very same can be said for most all of you. I asked a second question about how many of you are parents, and then I asked you to let those thoughts simmer for a while. There's an objective reason why I continue to focus on parenting. True leadership isn't at all about reinventing the wheel or quantum physics. Those things that I just mentioned, mentioned to direct, control, support, encourage, mentor, role model, teach, train, praise, reward, criticize, and discipline, they aren't about wheels or physics. They are simply about teaching, guiding, and learning. These are the very same things that we as parents do for and with our children every day, just as they were done for and with us. It's what we do for and with them, just as, we do, as was done for us. So I suggest to you tonight that what we must do is to take so many of those things we often do for and with our children in such a meaningful, objective, and worthy manner and carry them forward to all the venues we frequent in life. Take them into our communities, to our schools, the workplace, and our places of worship. Now I consider my graduation from Central as the first grand achievement in my life. That's why I wear this. And it has sustained me very well since. I left here having chosen not to forget those that left their fine footprints on that ladder in my life. There were several, and I chose not to forget them. Life's choices matter. And as you know by now, I am grateful to all of my life's role models. I said earlier that I readily admit to you that I stole something a little or a lot from them all. Just as I did, I urge you to steal a little or a lot from those that you admire and trust. True leadership matters. It makes a meaningful, lasting imprint on lives, on careers, and on those that really care. Remember, I am the optimistic one that has this engine running at high speed inside of me. I was the kid that grew up playing on the rooftops in downtown Boston. I'm the one that got that subtle nudge out the door of my high school and then enlisted in the U.S. Army as a very young man. I am the one that experienced a very gratifying 28-year career of public service, and all of that spawned my second career as a consultant. I am the one that is the father of two remarkable children that are exemplary professionals and fine examples of our true leaders. And I am also the one that has been honored to stand before you this evening. It is because of true leadership that ordinary people can achieve extraordinary things. Thank you for this opportunity tonight and for your kind attention. Most of my 
my ethical presentations go to first responders, that would be police, fire, and EMS personnel. And we, we talk about ethical conduct and behavior from a professional standpoint and an obligation to the standpoint, rather from my assertion that it is faith-based and it's learned from, from those around us, those that we trust in fire. But unfortunately, I can't do that because my, the nature of my consulting work doesn't generate any, any of that kind of work. There would be no one that, and if anyone did ask me, they would go in the corner and ask me why. Good question, though. nice question. Thank you. Anyone else? Sir? Can you speak to the effect of media in terms of shaping our image of a leader as well as how media can destroy the same leader that it has helped to create? Well, first part of your question, I, I said that they apply labels and they do this, um, in the, to me, indiscriminately. It's um, anyone in a position of power, authority, or influence who might be able to even inspire, they just throw the leader, they're all the, the leader, the leader. Steve Jobs passed away last night. He's a wonderful, wonderful guy. And incredibly, you know, he gave to science and technology what Beethoven gave to music. But was he a true leader? As what I describe and what I, I try to generate, uh, I don't know that because I didn't see him up close. Um, yes, leadership, the media does break down the concept of leadership. There's, there's no question about it. And when you put people on pedestals, people are on pedestals always become a target and they're the ones get knocked down most easily and very often they're put on the pedestal by the media and then knocked down by that very same media. Is respect a component of leadership? Is respect a component of leadership? I think it absolutely must be. Um, remember I say people that admire and you trust. And you can't have admiration and trust without that, you know, a very wholesome uh, helping of respect. So yes, Travis. At what age did you develop your philosophy? Oh, I guess I was 45 when I first started to um, I'm about to turn 66. I was 45 when I first really got into researching. I, I've told you about my role models, and they were all around me, and I consider them all leaders. So that always, I was always watching, observing, learning, stealing from them. But I really started to, to do fundamental research uh, on that whole concept in 1991. And then in 1997, my chief of police, Mary Rapdo, incredibly visionary leader, true leader. Uh, Mary assigned me to a one-year assignment to develop a leadership and supervision program for all of our sergeants, lieutenants, and oh, it had to be 60, 60 or 70 of them. And it was a one-year assignment and very, very successful in it. It really spawned my career uh, as a consultant Very, very proud of and very grateful for what Mary did. Someone else, did that answer your question? Yes? The concept of natural born leaders versus leadership being taught, can you explain a little bit further your views on that? Okay, I don't think that we are, we have innate leadership capacities uh, at birth. They are developed <coughs> by the influence, the inspiration, of uh, those around us as, as we grow. Uh, and I think then, in order to practice it, to fundamentally put it to work, we have to, uh, we have to continue to develop it and uh, cultivate it. But I think, it's, I think it's, a, it's, it's learned and developed rather than acquired. Now, I'm not a geneticist, but I've never, all my research, I've never Personality traits, yes, and that's where the great confusion comes you know, between the leadership traits, the character traits, the personal standards and values and principles, where they get confused with personality traits, you know, being charming and witty, funny, you know, having a cute answer to all the questions. Or, uh, those of you are endearing, engaging, uh, charismatic people, and I say that's one that worked for me. 
No one ever forgot this guy. No one that ever met him, he was so charismatic, so enormously charismatic. No one that ever met him for five minutes ever forgot him. He left such an impression on people, but it was not always. They have, who was it? Lou Holtz said something. If you don't want your wife or your daughter or read it in the newspaper or see it on TV, you know, don't do well. He, he was all over TV and radio. He, but very charismatic, but just couldn't be trusted. He had to put this guy on a leash and use a cattle prod. Troublesome, very troublesome, and he, he damaged the young and the impressionable. He literally put careers at risk. Because those young people, they'll see a guy in a responsible position or veteran position in a police department and say, oh, that's how it's done. So I'm going to go do it later. And it's tragic. Uh, affairs, professional standards, and investigation. People came in. Sorry. Based on what you said, I think you would agree with the statement, but I would like to, to find out what you think. Um, in terms of becoming an effective leader, um, I would argue that we have a problem in this world today of overly, overly specializing. And I would think that an openness to inspiration, almost a serendipity, um, is an important part of the process. Don't, don't shut doors where you think that's irrelevant. That history class, that sociology class, um, I'm not going to learn anything there. I think I can answer your question by talking about myself, and I hope I, I can answer your question. This is the only answer I really have to you, is that even after what I've been through, growing up in the, in the city, downtown Boston, in that mixed neighborhood, and then uh, went up in the Army as an 18-year-old, 28-year career in the, uh, much of it working in the trenches in difficult cities like Trenton, New Jersey, and Newark, New Jersey. Um, even after all of that, I consider myself, and I openly admit it, and I'm thankful for it, I consider myself naive, and I'm glad I've been able to preserve that sense of naivete. So, I hope maybe you can apply Someone else had a question over here? Yeah, does the word judgment apply in any of your leadership matrices? Uh, judgment in what term? Personal judgments of persons or? Exercise judgment? of judgment. Oh, exercise of good, yes. That's when I said discretion, fairness, prudence, patience, tolerance. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. It's very much essential. I just use other synonyms. Sorry. Would you consider Adolf Hitler a great leader? No, no. Adolf leader Adolf Hitler was uh, a menace to world good, and uh, I don't see any beneficial character traits that he manifested on either a regular or an irregular basis. And I've been watching all those shows on the History Channel about Adolf Hitler for the last three or four years. When you're retired, you have a lot of time on your hands to watch the History Channel. And, uh, but he was a he was a very very charismatic personality who could jumpstart people to move in different directions and, and and then they became advocates of his points of point of view. So you know he was one of those charismatic leaders that. So you think ethics, ethics plays a role? Ethics plays a role in a case like that? Oh yes, yes, yeah. And he was devoid of. You jumped around on roofs in Boston, grew up there, got the boot from high school, joined the Army and saw the work. How did you wind up in a small, a small college in Middle Missouri? Put your hand up again, sir. <laughs> <laughs> That's my uncle Richard Driscoll, class of 51. <laughs> Career high school principal in New Jersey. And I ran across cops mm -hmm. that worked for him. We're in some of my, my classes. Or we shared maybe a seminar that I attended, they attended, and find people from Medford Lakes, New Jersey. Cops were in a uniform, you didn't see their patch. They Medford Lakes, New Jersey. I said, gee, my uncle is, used to be the principal of Lenape Regional High School in Medford. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, who's that? I said, Richard, I never even had to speak his last name. They'd all say the same thing. Driscoll? 
<laughs> He's the one that got yeah. He threw me a lifeline when he came out of the army. <clears throat> People you admire and trust that did not want to disappoint me. Can you think of a person you would describe as having both charisma and the qualities of leadership that maybe we've experienced over the years? That's a, you know, I was I was trying to I was trying to find some. I'm going to say my dad without question. My uncle Richard, my son Kevin, my daughter Kathy. Yes, and, and I, I don't dispute it. But um, prominent personalities in society in whatever role they may play. I don't know. I used to think about Mickey Mantle, but you know he destroyed himself with his after hours arousal. So he really doesn't.